Her name is Matangi Maya Aruo Pragasam. Most people, though, know her as MIA. She's been renowned over the past 14 years for her music and for her politics. Her father was the founder of the Tamil resistance movement in Sri Lanka, where she spent much of her childhood before fleeing the country's civil war with her mother and siblings. She made her North American debut here in Toronto more than a decade ago. What's brought her back to us is the documentary Matangi Maya MIA, which her friend Steve Loveridge created about her. It screened at Hot Docs earlier this year. And with that, we welcome Maya to the studio. Hi. <laughs> it's nice to be here. Yeah. You know, the Drake Hotel was my first ever show in like in my life. Yeah, in Toronto? Too. Yeah. Yeah. So well, it's nice it's to have nice you back. To, yeah, it's nice to be here. Why <clears throat> was it important for you to be here for the premiere of your documentary? Uh, I think the largest uh, uh, Tamil community outside of the Sri Lankan North community is here. So I wanted to really connect this film to them as well, mm -hmm. as, as well as like my you know, Canadian fans that know me for my music and just everyone else. Uh, and, and to try and link both of it up together because it's a film that's important to both, like mm -hmm. my normal fans and also my Tamil fans. And <clears throat> now they kind of have to be one thing, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, yeah, it's like, a, it's like a struggle that we have, which is like to connect these two worlds. And try to find your place in the world, I guess. Yeah. Um, when you saw this documentary for the first time, um, it was done by your friend, Steve Loveridge, and you've been friends for a very long time, right? Yeah, I think like 20 years. 20 years, yeah. right? But you're still 21. I'm still 21. Because I'm still 21. 21. <laughs> Again. Yeah, okay, I've known him since I was two. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> but um, it was a lot of it was from footage that you had shot uh, yourself. Um, you wanted to be a documentarian before? Yeah, so I'm a bit jealous. You're a bit jealous that you did it? <laughs> yes. What was your, I know that the first time you saw it, you saw it in a theater with people. Yeah, it was at Sundance. Yeah, and your reaction at the beginning was kind of like, it wasn't what you were expecting. I was kind of taken aback by how personal it was. Um, just to give a sense of uh, what the documentary is about, let's take a, a look at some of the documentary. Uh, Sheldon, can you please roll? At least 100 have arrived in South London. I had to deal with the fact that I was different and I was an immigrant. The government say there are too many of them. In Sri Lanka, we were surrounded by a civil war. My dad was the founder of the Tamil resistance. You made us so strong for what you put us through. Music was my medicine. It just blew up so quickly. I lived through a war, came as a refugee that is now a pop star. What are the goalposts? What do I do? In the documentary, we see how you, um, you know, you're a very creative person through fashion, um, how you express yourself through music. What place has advocacy had in your music throughout your career? Is this something that just happened organically or is this something that you felt like you needed to do? Uh, it happened organically, mm -hmm. you know, because I think one of the things when you come over to a new country you try to assimilate so fast, right? And one of the things you do when you do that is to deny, um, yes, one- We're showing one the border's the, video? Yes. So yeah, when you come over, you kind of deny where you come from or any aspects of your past mm -hmm. to assimilate very quickly, you know? And you have to learn new languages, go to new schools, make new friends, and learn all the cultural, social codes of the new country mm -hmm. and, all of these things, and and I felt that, um, yeah, to me, it was always part of it, because I'd gone through that for like the first eight years of being in England, mm -hmm. and I denied being Sri Lankan. Then when I went back there, I felt like, you know, it was more of an impact, you know? Because you didn't want to leave, because when you went back to Sri Lanka, you went for a month, but you ended up staying for two months? Yeah, because I was, I was sort of like shocked by it because I realized how much I'd shut myself off from mm -hmm. it, you know? So everything was like quite mind blowing. Did you, know? you do that? I mean, you were young when you left. So mm -hmm. is that something that you did shutting it off or is it something that happened with your family? Uh, I think that, hmm, interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, I think personally I wanted to just like, 
fit in and be cool. And mm. like, I was interested in different things, you know, I was exposed to a new culture and a new country and new languages and new people. And I was very curious, you know, and so part of me felt hopeless about being connected to Sri Lanka. Like I tried to write letters mm -hmm. to people back home, but slowly, slowly you heard news that, you know, they're not there anymore, or they've been killed or blah, 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 has moved away. And so the life that you remembered in Sri Lanka was sort of disintegrating, you know, and it was, it was not the one that you left, you know, remembering. Mm -hmm. So, it, I think it's just like a safety mechanism. You just kind of shut it off and, you know, go forward. But even in England, um, you didn't really fit in because you were called names. Yeah. And then there's an interesting part in uh, the documentary where you do, when you first go back to Sri Lanka and one of your relatives is like, oh, well, you didn't really yeah. experience this. Um, what was that moment like? Was that hurtful? What your yes, relatives? and I think that's, that's really common for all of us mm -hmm. that, that who, who move is um, you don't quite fit in here, but when you go back, you don't quite fit in there, you know? And I think that's very unique to the immigrant refugee story, you know? And we're constantly trying to figure that out, especially if you're also the first generation, you know, like yourself. Mm -hmm. If you've made that transition and you do remember some of it, you know, to, to to discuss those uh, differences on both sides of, of where you come from mm -hmm. is, yeah, it's quite difficult. And in the film, we see your dad, uh, who founded Sri Lanka's Tamil resistance movement and worked with the Tamil Tigers. Uh, in Canada, our government lists the Tamil Tigers as a terrorist group and says, founded in 1976, Tamil Tigers is a Sri Lankan-based terrorist organization that seeks the creation of an independent homeland for Sri Lanka's ethnic Tamil minority. Although the group was militarily defeated in May 2009, subversion, destabilization, and fundraising continue, particularly in the diaspora. How do you view the Tamil Tigers? Well, my dad was part of a movement called EROS, uh, Elam Revolutionary Organization of Students, which then later became part absorbed by the Tigers because the Tigers were larger in number and part of Eros became something else. And then my dad became a mediator between the government and the Tigers. Um, but the way I view the Tigers now is, uh, you know, for me, I still say uh, the problems that we face hasn't really been answered and that hasn't been quite dealt with. And we as Tamils don't really have anybody to speak for us now or or to be concerned about our issues, you know. And <clears throat> the international community were very quick to label and tag uh, the tigers. Um, but at the same time, the, you know, accountability for the war crimes created by the government is very, very slow, you know. And nothing's really been done. Um, so on the one hand, yeah, people were really offended by uh, the Tamil people's support for t tigers. But if you take the tigers away, the Tamil people just don't have anybody else. And we know that we're dealing with a government that's actually quite prejudiced and is racist, which is, you know, it goes back a long, long, you know, there's, there's a history of it that's way beyond the Civil War, you know. And in terms of like the entire timeline of how, why uh, Tamil people feel oppressed by the state, I think it goes longer than, you know, the 35 years or 40 years. So Tigers is one small part of the story, but that discrimination and oppression hasn't been fixed. And, and I think, yeah, um, it's really difficult to watch the, silencing of Tamils, you know, using the word terrorism and uh, association to the tigers, you know, but really as a collective community, they, they, 
they, they, one of the things is fighting for their identity. Like, there needs to be an identity. Mm -hmm. There needs to be somebody that defines what the Tamil is. You but know? You've, um, you've been called a terrorist yourself because you support the Tamil Tigers. How does that feel to be called a terrorist? Yeah, I mean, I'm a musician, you know, I haven't abused anyone or killed anyone or, or been to war in my life. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is, it just shows the flippancy in which we use that word terrorism to apply to so many people who are, you know, underprivileged or minorities in faraway countries. And the West has a responsibility to understand, mm -hmm. you know, the the diverse, uh, the diversity in problems faced around the world by many different communities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the same. They were trying to apply um, this to something as drastic as, uh, you know, what's happening in the Middle East to... Uh, what might happen in Ireland and then what happens in Sri Lanka to what happens in, you know, with ISIS or whatever, and then they join it all up to this one word. But it doesn't really discuss, like, the history of these places and really what's happened and put these people in situations where they had to form resistance movement and had to fight oppression, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, what about on the artistic level? Like, how big a role do you think the controversy of your Tamil Tiger connection played in your success? I was the only Tamil singer who'd ever been nominated for an Oscar, Mercury, Brit, and... Um, a Grammy. A Grammy, mm -hmm. and also won the BET Award mm -hmm. uh, that same year, you know, and it's never happened in the history ever before or since. And it just so happens that that particular moment when that happened, the Sri Lankan civil war was coming to an end. Like, it's just common sense to me, mm. or, you know, it's like it goes without saying I'm going to talk about it and be uh, vocal about that because it is part of who I am. It is, you know, it displaced me and I built my life based on what happened there. And my family was still there and many people were affected by it. You know, my grandma was affected by it. Like, it's not, it's not something that, you know, I was referencing. It's like, that is me. It's part of what I am. And, yeah, I think that's just their sort of um, laziness or ignorance to, to really fully investigate what it's like when you're the first person coming up from a space like that. You know, because people are used to... Uh, pop stars coming from the West and or discussing other issues, but they've never had to deal with somebody coming up from somewhere quite far away discussing something very specific, you know. And I think it's easier to shut it down and be like, oh, this doesn't mean anything, than to actually take the time and understand it. And then that video, uh, Born Free, yeah. um, it, at one point YouTube uh, pulled it. What was your vision for that video? What were you trying to say? Well, it was based on a true story that I heard. Um, so I was interested in... Yes, I was inter interested in seeing what would happen if you... You know, because I tried to... I tried to show people the real videos, because during this time on YouTube, uh, the real footage from smartphones filmed by soldiers while they were, you know, raping women and capturing um, and executing people were posted on YouTube as, like, a boasting thing. Um, and that material was not censored. It was there, and Tamils could see it, you know, and the Singleys used YouTube to post these videos to, you know, um, brag about it. And... So I found that really frustrating because I could see the events happening because it's there and smart people had smartphones for the first time that year. And um, yet yeah, there was no response from an, or an outcry from the international media. So I just felt that something uh, 
needed to be sort of explored mm -hmm. in that sense. So, yeah, I, I just thought I'll take that Tamil video and then I'll just change the characters and make everybody, you know, Western and see if it, if it relates to people, you know. Of all the criticisms that you've heard um, or read about yourself, what has been the most fair or accurate? Criticisms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's like an Encyclopedia Britannica <laughs> of criticisms. What has been the most accurate? Or what has been the most unfair? I mean, every, all of them has been quite unfair, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it's because you're the first. And I, I understand that. Like, I approach everything with a 50-50, you know, like, understanding. I'm like, I understand, because there hasn't been a, 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 you know, a Sri Lankan pop star before. So I understand that there's room for, you know, misunderstanding. Uh, and also, I'm not a trained musician or a trained politician or trained in anything. I'm actually you know, a refugee who came from an underprivileged, like, you know, below poverty line upbringing and climbed my way up and got an education, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I kind of wanted to include all of these things to what, you know, it wasn't just I'm a Tamil, mm -hmm. I'm a refugee, but it's also this is what it's like living on a council flat, and this is what it's like being poor, this is what it's like being uneducated, this is what it feels like being, you know. So it was, I wanted to talk about all of those things. And that's why you run into so many, like, misunderstanding, because these are all very, like, uh, huge. And probably topic. unfamiliar topics for some people. Yes, and also it's very unfam unfamiliar to people to have a brown woman talk about these things, you know. And I'm getting the sense too that uh, it must have been lonely trying to navigate those spaces without having anybody before Yeah, you. because you don't have like a, you know, uh, your peers or colleagues that you can call and be like, what was it like for you? Because mm -hmm. it is completely unique, you know, mm -hmm. even to this day when you get called names or the press goes after you or whatever the thing is, you can't there isn't somebody you can call mm -hmm. and be like, what was it like for you when it happened to you? Or, you know, or I can't call anyone and say, well, when it happened to me, this is what's going to happen to you. Like, there isn't another person coming after you either. Mm -hmm. So it is very isolating, but that, that does create room for... Artistry and creativity, I'm thinking. Yes, that's yeah. the positive. Mm -hmm. It creates room for limitless you know, possibilities because mm -hmm. uh, you're the first, but at the same time, I can, I can understand the, the misunderstanding too. Do you think that this documentary um, allows people to see the whole Maya? It, it's never, I mean, it's 90 minutes <laughs> and I handed him 700 hours. So it's never going to be the whole my thing. Cause but does, I, it, I does, it, does it clear up some misconceptions? I think so. I think, you know, people have always asked me, you know, are you like, are you, you know, coming from a privileged background? Your mum and dad are doctors and you did this, or, you know, were you really like that? Did you really come from a council flat and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I think, um, yeah, there's, there's like, for example, there's a shot in the film where my um, uncle's reading the sexual assault mm -hmm. crimes against women. And um, I landed my first day when the auto arrives, I landed in the middle of a protest where all the women, Tamil women, were protesting in the middle of the city centre because uh, a female teacher had been raped in broad daylight at 7 p.m. on the way home from school at the busiest, you know, like Times Square of Colombo in the capital um, by 14 soldiers and policemen. And they all had been acquitted that day. So when my pl plane landed, it's the first time I'm visiting Sri Lanka since I left as a 10 year old. And I landed in the middle of the protests and the riots. So that just like changed my entire journey there because mm -hmm. 
that's what I landed into. And it's not in the documentary. So, like, for me, that actually is what kind of drove the direction of what I felt there, you know. But uh, that incident's not in it. And, and when my uncle's reading that list, my uncle is the person who actually documents all of the assaults that had happened for 20, 25 years for Amnesty International. And that's not really said for his safety. So all of these things, I just found that it was, uh, the documentary's quite lighthearted in that sense, mm. you know, and that Steve actually left out a lot of the gruesome, you know, stuff that I'd filmed, mm. which the reality was a lot more gruesome. Yeah. But I think it, having watched it, um, I feel like I have a better understanding of what it is that you are doing and what you've been trying to say. Um, and I think maybe it gives other people an opportunity to not to like misquote you or um, perceive you to be something that you, you're, you know, not, you're not saying. Um, but we only have like one minute left. <laughs> We've actually gone over. Sorry. Uh, no, it's been a, a great conversation and I wish we had more time. But uh, what are your future plans for music and for uh, continuing your activism? I would like to explore that space a bit more. I think that, that um, the rich and poor divide has only grown even more. And the refugee community has grown even more in the last 15 years. And the, you know, um, the poverty line and the lack of education, all of these things are just growing, even though we are technologically advanced and we have all the resources in the world and et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I think I want to explore that more, to be like, no, I'm not going to go away. Actually, this is, this is not solved and it's, it's still a problem. And these kids still do have dreams, you know, and they, they, they deserve education because we've got the means to have that, you know. And, and I think that's, that's uh, uh, an important aspect of thinking, uh, thinking like globally and, and making people feel like, I, I guess, confident, you know. That, and that they matter. They matter. Mm -hmm. And no matter where they come from, they can still have a dream and still try to make it, even if they've got, you know, a cardboard box and a pair of scissors and they need to get you know, going and... Maya, yeah. thank you so much. It's been an absolute privilege to speak to you. It's always been a dream of mine to meet you and to talk to you. Thank you for being thank here you. Thanks for having on the agenda. Me. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.